So yeah, what's new in your life? Been a couple weeks since we did one of these. Is it? Yeah. Was Josh the last one? I think so. <clears throat> wow. See, we were supposed to do the Super Bowl one. Right, right, right. But because we're flexible with our plan. So uh, I think it's just as good now time as any to welcome everyone to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben. I'm Justin. We're the co-founders of Storyboard Media, and this week we are the Sacagaweas to your Lewis and Clark in your quest for westward video expansion. It's a manifest to the destiny frontier kind of, of video. Thing. Yes, just straight to the Pacific, uh, as we just teased, but we don't really ever know how much of our intro banter ends up uh, in the episode. Yeah, what are we talking about today? We are talking about how to be flexible with your strategy. Um, before we jump in, though, um, it is. Unfortunately, time for another sponsor. We just can't seem to hold on to a sponsor for more than one episode at a time, which is interesting because now we've actually been contacted by a couple of places to legitimately sponsor our podcast, and we're not sure how to <laughs> marry that with our really enjoyable fake pod. I mean, yeah, I don't know previous how... podcast sponsors. Yeah, well, that's if somebody puts money that's... in front of us, we'll figure it out. <laughs> So what's uh, what's our sponsor's name this week? Uh, this week is Pillsbury Pregnancy Program for Men. Tee hee. Oh, okay, yeah, that's the doughboy. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who aren't following us on Instagram Live, Justin just uh, reached across the table to try to poke my belly. Yeah, it didn't reach. Didn't quite get there. I have long arms. I tee hee anyway, a belly, and yeah. it didn't. Still didn't connect. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I'm very interested to hear the pills. Very pregnancy program for men's spot later on in the episode. Mm -hmm. that, yep. That's uh, really happy to have them along. I think it's also uh, a time for us to mention, again, before we dive into the premise of this episode, which is about flexibility within strategic plans, um, that we can certainly keep coming up with episode topics and, in fact, have no problem doing that. But we're making a lot of assumptions that our audience wants to hear what, what it is we want to talk about. And so, to you, our listening audience, yes, you. David and... <laughs> and Patrick and Hamed. And... That's pretty much all I know. Yeah. There's that guy that, that we talked to that one time on That's the phone. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, for the four of you... Oh, and Karen. <clears throat> my mom. Yeah. Um, and apparently my mom, occasionally. They, I'm pretty sure they download it. Oh no! Your mom listened my, to my it. mom she called. Me, my mom called me out. On a sponsor. Uh, no, my what? mom called me out on my dad only saying he was proud of me three times. Ah, just a random yeah. text. Well, that's like, not your fault. No, it's not Unless my fault. Unless you didn't do things to impress your father. Don't bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so I, I would encourage all of our listeners to, however you want to communicate with us, let us know what you'd like to hear us talk about. Um, we're all about providing value and and having our listeners learn and if we're talking about stuff that isn't relevant to you then what's the point of this whole thing so right. uh, a whole lot of ways to do that i think probably most of the people who listen know how to reach us uh by text uh ben at storyboardmedia.co or justin at storyboardmedia.co great opportunity to you know put a comment in on a social channel uh, or you know I'll put it in on a rating. They haven't answered my question mm -hmm. on so-and-so Send us so a yet. letter. I'll take anything. Yeah. Ooh, a letter would be nice. That'd a handwritten nice. note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so just want to get that out there. Um, you tell us what you want us to talk about. So, to today's topic. Um, we talk an awful lot about strategy. Mm -hmm. For anybody who's listened to the Seven Phases uh, episodes or... Uh, seen our seven phases post page, whatever we have. Well, it may even be important <clears throat> to mention we did, yeah, the seven phases, right? Mm. We did two episodes discussing the seven phases. Yeah. The entire first episode was about strategy. strategy. The the second episode was about two Everything through else. seven. Yes. So that's I mean that's how the importance which we place upon strategy. So go on yeah. with it. So we talk about it a lot, but I think strategy is still one of those terms that kind of polarizes people because either they don't, you know, they think that you're just using it as a buzzword, mm -hmm. but also I, I think a lot of it honestly comes down to like, I don't know if it's an introvert extrovert thing, but like there are planners and there are doers mm -hmm. and a lot of planners put all of their energy into creating the plan and then hope to God someone else can go take it and execute it. Whereas the other side of that coin is a lot of doers 
don't really care what the plan is, but as soon as they're given one, they're going to go and and execute it. Mm-hmm. They don't care why you put it together. So I, you know, I think it makes sense that a lot of people are just kind of polarized by the idea of strategy. But I think a lot of what people get into is, well, if you spend all of this time and all of this energy putting a plan together, what happens if when something changes? Sure. Like, do you follow it like gospel, or? And what we're going to talk about today is how can you be flexible within that plan? With growth stage companies or growing companies of any sort, companies who are going to implement a year's worth of video or even a video, stuff's going to change, right? Video doesn't happen in a day. Like, I guess some of it can, actually. Yeah. Some of it can happen in two minutes. But when you have a strategy that's usually looking at a long-term thing, um, strategies are for long-term planning. Yep. Crazy shit happens in the yep. startup world and the growth world. And I, I did just see one of my notes here too that I just added um, in the last hour or so. But I think flexibility within plans is something that like people at management level and like C-suite level they get that mm-hmm. right. That's how they get to that level. But I think a lot mm-hmm. of our listeners are kind of that middle level and even some of those lower in the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. I think the lower in the hierarchy you get. Those are the people who are doing the more tactical stuff anyway. Yep. It's their job to write a blog post. It's their job to execute a PPC campaign. Yeah. Whatever it may be. And so they may be aware that there's a plan, but like for them, there's some comfort in every day coming to work knowing this is what I have to do. But, you know, whether it's you or the people above you, there's got to be that kind of leeway in terms of, all right, well, shit hit the fan, Mm -hmm. but now. So... I think I'll, I, I want to start by addressing like the haters of strategy, right? Who just say like, "What's the point in even planning something out?" Because stuff changes all the time. Okay. And I imagine this is one of those misattributed quotes. So you know, don't at me. But like, I think the Eisenhower quote is Dalai Lama. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Bill Murray once said. <clears throat> Dwight Eisenhower apparently once said, "In preparing for battle, I have found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable." Mike, okay. Ty- Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Now, that's not how he said it, though. No. How did he say it? Uh, is it on here? Yeah. Everyone had to plan until they get punched in the mouth. Mouth? <laughs> yeah. That surprise guest Don't this episode. Don't tell Mike Tyson. Uh, Mike Tyson is here. <laughs> hey, Mike. <laughs> no, <laughs> that was a no. Uh, I, have, I heard he owns like tigers, or maybe I just saw it in, in the Hangover. But I'm not going to mess with Mike Tyson too much. Uh huh. So I'm sure he's listening. Yes, big fan of the cast. Um. So anyway, I, I'm I'm I've been intrigued for quite a while about because I'm a planner. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm one of those people who falls on the like. Let me play the chess game. Let me figure out what all of our moves are and then mm-hmm. hand it off to someone to go actually do it. Which has been great for us. I'm a doer. Mm-hmm. If you say we need to get across town, I will drive immediately and go light to light. I won't wait until all the lights are green mm-hmm. and then go. Like I, I'm just like, all right, let's get there and figure it out. Let's get there and figure it out. So, I think that's, I, and I think that actually leads into another good metaphor and maybe it's in our notes here somewhere <clears throat> later, but I think there's a Google Maps metaphor in here too. <clears throat> So the flexibility with the strategy is like if you if you say if I gave you that address if we needed to get to Atlanta mm-hmm. and I sent you I dropped a pin for you and you put it in Google Maps and it would tell us how to get there. Mm-hmm. But as we're going, Google Maps is smart enough to recognize when there's traffic, mm-hmm. when there are detours, when there are faster ways to go. So it doesn't just you don't hit start on Google Maps it's one and way. stick to the exact <clears> same <throat> way. As you go along that journey, it tells you, hey, there's a faster route available. And that's kind of how I see a strategy. Put the plan in place, but then be aware of your surroundings, what's yeah. going on, so that you can adjust. Back to Eisenhower. The, to me, that speaks so much to the value in what you get when you actually go through and develop the strategy. In the strategy episode, which is what, episode one? Yeah. Two well, uh, of this one, pod, episode one, we talk about how like the first half of developing your own strategy, your own video roadmap is kind of a look inward, right? It's that internal mm-hmm. audit. What are our department's goals? Mm-hmm. What are our company's goals? 
What are my personal goals? Mm -hmm. Who is our audience? What resources do I have? What resources do we have? What channels do we have to use? What kind of budget do we have? Constraints, right? yep. The whole, and when we do it for clients, we actually have this whole halftime report, which is here's what you told us. Here's what all the people in <clears throat> that, you know, as a stakeholder, here's what they've told us. About, about you, about your company. Mm -hmm. And here's where we've identified we can't help you. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna go away and figure out how to put that plan together. Right. So the first ever strategic engagement we did with one of our video clients. I think I know. <clears throat> we went in and did like a full day workshop yeah. with their marketing team, marketing CMO and marketing managers. Basically, yeah. some of the data people weren't in there. But what what was so valuable or what what was surprised me? Oh, actually, seemed, it was it was the entire scope because it had the people actually doing the things too, right? Oh yeah, that's right. Like some of the photographers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we were going through kind of this one day workshop to assess goals, revenue goals, marketing goals, um, you know, developing personas. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that surprised me the most was that a company of that size had never really spent the time away from, I mean, we, we essentially locked them in the CMO's office for a day. Uh, phones were off. We took like two breaks and a lunch break. Mm -hmm. They and a lot of companies had never really sat down to think about who are our personas. I mean, it, it kind of caught us off guard a little bit how much work <clears throat> we needed to do with them um, because they had certain ideas of things. But when we tried to put it into the structure that we had developed, they needed to flesh those things out. Mm -hmm. And and you know, from a metaphor standpoint, we did have to be a little bit flexible in that workshop too because we ended up realizing we needed to spend a lot more time on developing these things instead of just hearing them from them. Yeah, the reason for that is, is not that anybody's necessarily doing anything wrong, but somebody gets hired in January and that person gets told, here are our, our personas. And then somebody gets hired in June, but they're not really at that level. So they just have to assume and, and kind of work with what they think they know. And then uh, in July, the CMO realizes, oh, this audience is obsolete. And this one is our new market, and but doesn't relay that information. So things keep rolling and rolling. Yeah. And if you don't take the time to actually ask these questions of yourselves, everyone's got a different idea of who you're talking to. So it's important just to do this, whether you're hiring somebody to help you or not, it's important to do. Yeah. So the, the beauty of putting a strategy together is that you know these are our goals. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is who we're trying to and talk to. Everyone on the team across the board knows it. Yes. And so if if uh, if there's a change in CMO or a new unexpected acquisition happens and all of a sudden there's a new product or something like that, you've actually got this base information laid out. Everybody's all on the same page with it and that makes it easier to then kind of pivot the direction that you need to go with that strategy. The reason for our halftime is to say, all right, everybody, here's what we've heard. Is this correct? So that is their, their recipe, I guess like the, the things that they need to know moving forward as a team. That, at that point, they could say, all right, get lost guys, we're good. Yeah. We know what we're doing, or at least we know what our intentions are and what our constraints are. For us, then at that point, we take off and see how can we solve these problems with video. Right. But like, but just having that that halftime report has a lot of value. Yeah. So, however, you know, whether it's us or anybody else doing this sort of thing, just taking the time to to have somebody ask the right questions is important. I think you know, main point there being that even if you're going to break from your roadmap from your strategy there's still so much value in having laid out the principal pieces so that you can adjust mm -hmm. accordingly. All right, what about um, the Mike Tyson part of this? What about when you get punched in the face? Uh, maybe- what, Give me some examples of what that might be. So for, if you're a growth stage B2B company, let's say- Well, and I think that's a great example <clears throat> too because it happens, we work with a lot of growth stage companies and change happens constantly. Always. At, at startups and, and growth stage companies, week to week, fundamental initiatives sure. may change. <clears throat> and, and so I think a lot of those companies also tend to be like, well, why are we gonna put a plan in place? Because everything's always different. Yeah. Again, we're just trying to I glue this to shit together. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, let's, yeah, 
let's glue it together and let's see what kind of popsicle stick house we can make. And then, think, you know. I think for me, one of the, the most important parts of a strategy session or understanding of what, what our strategy is, is the ability to prioritize. Yes. So it's, we've got all this shit going on. What are our goals and how can I achieve that? Mm-hmm. And where do they rank within uh, within the, organiz- like the importance of the organization. So when things change, when a, a, a boss gets fired or a new, like a chief officer gets hired mm-hmm. for a department. Never had a CRO before. Now right. we got a chief revenue officer. <clears throat> yeah. You, you know how you, like, I don't know, a chief officer can, can come in and say, everything's different now. True. So, I mean, that's the, some, sometimes that's their job. Yeah. Um, but, but let's say you just got a new round of funding. So you, thank you, you. No, let's say our client got a new round of funding. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now you've got an extra $40 million to pump into this. I am so out of here. Usually it's going into to sales and engineering, usually, if yeah. it's a tech company. Yep. But the rest of the company has to adapt with that. So what do we need to do? If we need salespeople, or, or programs or whatever, we need to pump money into sales, um, whether that's tools or hiring or whatever it is, training. I also think when they go straight to sales, it's because it's more closely directly connected to the revenue part, right? Mm-hmm. Because a salesperson closes a deal. And then or opens a deal, but yeah. Right, but, but they're the ones who close the deal that actually get the incoming wire transfer from a new customer sure. or an existing customer yeah, for yeah. more. Yeah. Marketing, is just that unfortunate one additional step away. But that sales team, if you're investing in the sales team, that sales team still needs to have leads. If you're growing a sales team, you've got to give them more inbound leads, right? Or more content to use in their outreach if it's cold outreach. And if your customer success, you're usually like the redheaded stepchild, it feels like for, for a lot of organizations. And so they're stuck trying to figure out, all right, we have 200 new customers a month how are we going to scale our operation with only one additional headcount? Mm-hmm. Like that—that's the beauty of video. I don't, I'm not sure <laughs> that I can avoid saying that, but like being able to scale think, some of those things. I think our bias is noted, and everyone's aware <laughs> of where we stand on the value sure. of video. Generally, pro video over generally, here. Generally, <laughs> but generally speaking, things change often and quickly. Yes. Uh, well, and and we we've had clients who we get to you'll hear the two sides of the same complaint from the sales department and the customer service or support department. You'll hear sales all of a sudden start to say things like, I'm beginning to get concerned that our customer support can deliver what I'm selling Mm -hmm. these people. Mm -hmm. And then you've got those customer support people saying, I'm beginning to be concerned that our salespeople are selling something that we can't execute. Yep. And and with those customer support people, I put product development and, and those people in there too. Mm-hmm. And so often, marketing is then like made aware by, you know, the the product team. Hey, we're adding these new features, and so they start pushing out new features. The salespeople start selling those new features, and it hasn't gotten to where it's actually been developed right. to a point where the support people actually know how to support any of those new sure. features. And so I don't know where I was going with that either, but it is it is something else that we have come across in terms of growth stage companies. Another good example, we started working with maybe our second or third like kind of strategic endeavor with a client. Uh, we started working with them right after a round of funding. So ideally like they were like in a good place to kind of like, all right, let's regroup and set our path. And if you're talking about who I think you're talking about, like one of those 10 year overnight successes too. Yes. Like they've been around forever, but then all of a sudden, but then all of a sudden, like boom, they're exploding. So tell me, like describe that situation. What changed as that developed, as they um, went from, all right, we got 10 or 13 million over, and then over the next six months, what happened? So we had gone in and worked with the entire company. And to put together a, a video roadmap for their marketing department, their sales department, their customer success. We had even talked to um, HR 
and, and recruiting mm-hmm. at that point, mm-hmm. which isn't something that we lead with, but there were opportunities yeah. because they were hiring right. so many people, right? So we had laid out this company-wide video strategy that upon delivery date, eight months ahead or whatever, the day that, that we said this is the plan or presented ah. the plan yeah. made perfect sense. And we had even, and we knew the budget that we were working with at that point too. So even we even prioritized it into like three phases, right? Mm-hmm. Phase one, this initial spend, here are the videos we're gonna focus yep. on. Prioritizing. Phase two, content. here's what we need to do next. Because that was, that was kind of the like, let's prove ourselves with this initial tranche of money. You've got all of this money in our doing, so let's earmark some of it now. Here's what we're gonna yeah. do with it. Yeah. And then phase C was like, and here's all the other stuff that we've identified. One of the key elements in phase one was this kind of sequence, and we've talked about these before, the kind of why, what, how sequence. And with them, at that time, they didn't have a clearly defined brand why, like the Simon Sinek why. In fact, I think our strategic concept even starts with not Not the Simon Sinek (laughs) why, why, but it was going to be a series of videos for their distinctly different persona, siloed personas that was going to use clients to say why I work with this Mm -hmm. company, why I I use this platform. And then we were going to dump it down into the next layer, which was like what this thing does. Mm -hmm. And then it was going to get to how this thing actually works, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of that key kind of top of funnel and then starting to get into actual solutions, starting Mm -hmm. to go down the marketing part of the funnel. We decided to start with the the actually like how it works yep. content first. Very demo based, right? Here's the technology. Here's the, the exact feature set that you would be interested in. Which could also be part of this discussion because while we were in production on that, fr- the product department delivered a new version of mm-hmm. the app, mm-hmm. which caused all kinds of production problems. But um, so by the time we, we came back to the uh, the why videos. The CEO, actually the board, had spent some time really thinking about as they were growing, they needed to like rein in their company culture. They needed everyone who worked there to come into work every day motivated by this kind of core guiding they wanted, principle. Right? They wanted their team to work with a common purpose. They wanted to attract talent that had that purpose, yep. and they wanted clients who understood that purpose. Yes, and it's, per- it's perfect. And in that process, they discovered their why, right. their Simon Sinek why. Yeah. And so, if we had just completely stuck to the plan, we could have just made those three videos for those three audiences that are testimonial style, top of funnel stuff, like why I use this. Mm-hmm. But there was too good an opportunity, and. I think it was fortunate too that we were able to work with the CEO on developing his presentation to fit of the that, style of the why, to, you know, yeah. to the company, right? Yeah. And so we were we were kind of like knee deep in this why message in a boardroom at message. six o'clock at night. Yeah, and so it, I mean, it was just hitting us over the head that we need to adjust and say instead of making these three, you know, why I use this things, now we can actually say why we are a company. Mm-hmm. I think it would have been irresponsible and a disservice of, uh, of for us to have said, no, no, this is the plan. Mm-hmm. We've got to stick with this. Right. Yeah, um, of course. Because, and, and that was, I mean, God, I mean, how, ma- how many companies are lucky enough to have that kind of moment mm-hmm. where they actually get to that kind of like fundamental, I have figured out how to position our company or our product or whatever that it is. That appeals to all shareholders, stakeholders, yeah. Yeah. And so that was one where, where it was less of a like shit hit the fan kind of thing, but it was like, okay, this company is actually growing up in front of our eyes. They're starting to figure out these things and we need to help them communicate yep. that. And that, that- Those are some of their most used <clears throat> videos at the moment. I just yep. was talking to the okay. sales guy. Good. So, you know, again, go back to the Google Maps metaphor. It's like we're on 85 South <clears throat> and you know, this whole new bypass around Greenville, South Carolina opens up or something Mm -hmm. while we're on our drive. And it's going to take 45 minutes off your, you know, off the drive to Atlanta. Well, then let's go that way. Mm -hmm. You know, just because we were supposed to go through Greenville or what, I'm Mm -hmm. extending the metaphor a bit much, but 
you know, like, okay, this was the opportunity that was just handed to us. There's, and always, there's always construction, though, in in South Carolina. I that's mean, true. It's, it's been and, there And, like, ever. up to Charlotte. God, I feel yeah, like that's been going I know. for 20 like, years. Yeah, but... Uh, but China Grove? China Grove, yeah, China yeah, yeah. Grove! Oh, uh, Doobie Brothers. Cool. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> See, that's the kind of stuff that you get on Instagram Live that you don't get in the edit. You may not get in the edit. Well, you might get in the edit. We'll see. It, you it know depends what? how frisky Anthony's yes. feeling. I was just going to say, <laughs> our our podcast episodes probably very much reflect Anthony's mood while they I They wax and wane depend on, mm-hmm. on, <laughs> yeah. on that. And I know he likes to take everything out about him, so he'll probably take that part out, right. but leave in the China Grove. Whoa, China Grove. Part of it. Shall we hear from our feels sponsor? Like, feels like the right time to, to bring in the sponsor yeah. break here. If you're like most men these days, you're probably asking yourself, how can I be a better feminist? I marched in DC back in 2017. I committed to the uh, the he for she global movement. I even shave my legs every day and wear high heels at home. What more should I be doing? It's time to get pregnant. That's the answer. Pillsbury Pregnancy Program for men. More about this. And so it's a 10 month commitment it, it comes with all the necessary elements of pregnancy. So first, yeah, the there's belly. The, there's a Pillsbury pregnancy hoodie you kind of put on and, and wear. Okay. It, you, you cannot take it so off. So it sure. gradually gains mass over a 10-month period up to a 10-pound baby. Okay. Which is pretty large It comes baby. with electrodes that, it, like, through the, the sweatshirt, they attach to your abdomen and cause a lot of painful cramping. Something. Yeah, okay. Kind of like, like a smoking cessation patch. That uh, that injects hormones into your body, causing wild mood swings. Restless sure. Need to um, nest. Start like yeah. Getting the home ready. Get the home ready. Term. Yep. Or is it put um, like twigs in your living room? <laughs> twigs and like strips of newspaper. No, it's yeah. It's not that. It's oh, kind okay. of the more domestic version gotcha. of that. Uh, Once uh, you're at full term, at at just the time the electrode induced contractions get super serious, they'll even send someone to your location to help deliver the final painful blow. So you could be, you are not. You don't know when this is gonna happen, this is going to happen. It's Then it's so, not over, of course, you'll have months of recovery, as well as an erratic noise machine that's designed to force you out of bed in the middle of the night to console it. Kind of think of it as like a like a Roomba, you kind of, you almost never know where it is mm. or what time it's gonna go off. Mm-hmm. So with, yeah. Um, but like, so like the cheap Roombas. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> but in um, order to emulate the dreadful medical expenses, it's very pricey. So Sure. Uh, of course, you don't actually know ahead of time how much it's going to cost. You just sign up and kind of get billed as you so go. That's, that's the Pillsbury Pregnancy Program. <laughs> okay. Uh, as far as I for understand men. it, for men. Yes. For men. Okay. So back to flexibility within a strategy. Mm-hmm. We've talked about the value in the planning itself, right? The, the, you know, the Eisenhower quote, in preparing for battle, I found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. We've talked about being responsive and, and agile, not from a coding standpoint, mm-hmm. but just like, you know, agile in terms of when, when opportunities present themselves and when shit to hits capitalize the fan. It, yeah, right. To capitalize and then also kind of retreat when to retreat and i think it it all kind of resolves itself into treating the strategy treating and and for us again like the document itself is the roadmap that we deliver to our clients treating that as a living document so actually building in opportunities to review it update it assess it on a regular basis because i think i think one of the one of the greatest failings you could make when going through the time and effort and money of putting together a strategy is then just to either let it sit in the corner or on a shelf somewhere or just follow it blindly or pass it on down and let your team follow Mm -hmm. it blindly. I mean, you know, we kind of came at this from like, what if something happens? But now it's almost your responsibility to just be aware of what's happening around you, economic factors, product factors, growth factors, all Mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So I think one of my suggestions would be to build in, and I, and I think this is a function of how fast your company and your industry is moving, but build in maybe quarterly check-ins. 
right? Yeah. Or, or at least annual check-ins. Um, I don't think we have ever thought to deliver a video roadmap that that is more than 12 months in length. Mm-mm. So much changes in any company over one year. But if you're in a, if you're in a growth stage company, probably someone on your team should be assessing that roadmap once a quarter. Right. What has changed? Are our goals different, right? Um, are our products different? Have we just gotten a big fundraising round mm-hmm. and it's a changed some of changing. our... Yeah. It's also important to note that the first idea isn't necessarily the best idea. Oftentimes, and we find this a lot with our clients, there's there's the work that you do to look inward and and develop the goals and and do all of that kind of diagnosis before prescribing the the plan. Mm-hmm. But then there's also so much you learn by actually executing that plan and talking to customers and writing scripts and shooting and editing videos and and putting them out there and when we talk about the seven phases, this is why that that seventh phase analysis right. loops right back into the strategy, right? We have such an opportunity to learn so much from our from our video content in terms of, of what assumptions we were making early on, what we thought their journey was, and we can actually map that against what their actual behaviors are. Mm-hmm. That again, I feel like it would be irresponsible to look at that and not make changes to right. the strategy. And so, you know, just because the plan that was laid out when you put the roadmap together, felt like it was the perfect plan, doesn't mean that you're not gonna have other experiences that say, I understand our customers better. I understand our messaging better. I, whatever it is. I mean, we, for the the workshop, our first strategic engagement, we gave them their new tagline in writing a script for a kind of top of funnel piece for them. And they adopted that as the tagline for the whole brand. Right. Right, and so all of a sudden that gave an additional perspective and an additional creative constraint Mm -hmm. to all the content that they were producing and what we were producing for them. Um, So don't be afraid to, and and this is something that I think I I tend to at least default kind of struggle with. When I put a plan together, I feel like I've kind of thought of all of the options. And so this is, hey, this is the best way to do this. But But you had a limited knowledge when you made those decisions. Yes, and so like, Set aside the pride of ownership and recognize, if anything, take pride in the awareness of what's changed and say, you know what, I think we should make some changes here. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think that was a a very grown up moment to recognize perhaps where you fault. Well, I don't know that I'd I'd say fault. (laughs) (laughs) And there goes the adult moment. yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not gonna. I, th- this personal revelation moment is later in the episode because I know my mom won't make it to here. Okay. Yeah, I think there are certain triggers you could go into your roadmap and and say we're gonna get some investments later this year, or I know that our executive team is looking for another round of funding, whatever. Or we're gonna go international as soon as we get that money. Yeah, we're gonna go ahead and and everybody's going to be fighting over the additional budget, but like we're, we've actually got a plan that we're ready to, that's been that's to implement. so much. That's so helpful for that, the, the client to know phase two looks like this. And so that, you know, let's say everything stays the same. Even next step is this, it just to be able to go in and say, here's our plan. Once this thing happens is puts your department or your initiative or whatever way above the rest. Yeah. And, and, there's there's just way fewer question marks as to what's going to happen with that money. And especially when it comes to fundraising rounds, there are so many like growth targets that are um, associated with those investments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're marked, yeah. Right? That, that you've got to, you know, I'm going to invest, this group is going to invest $10 million in this company and we expect this many customers by this date, mm-hmm. this much revenue by this, you know, and you those kinds all that, of things. We need to have this many SDRs and this many whatever. And so a lot of it is, you know, if you've got those plans in place, you get to be the executive who goes to the board first saying, this is how I need to use I'm gonna this I'm going to do money. my job. Instead exactly. of responding to it. Right. Like, okay, I need to launch my phase two. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. What else? I feel like, feel like kind of covered 
we're looking for? Are there any action steps you think that are, or like, let's say someone, uh, there's no good or bad time necessarily to, to, to do the strategy. Is there, is there a, a best time to create it? And then, and like, should you wait until something or no? I think, I, I think this is an unspoken rule for us, but like I just mentioned a few minutes ago, we've I don't think we've ever even imagined what laying out a roadmap that looks longer than a year would look like because mm-hmm. we know so much is going to change. I don't have anything other than that kind of anecdotal evidence. I wouldn't set out to to def- set a defined strategy for more than about a year. You can certainly say then in year two we're going to do more mid funnel <coughs> content yep. and I mean you can be vague about it. Um, so I think at least once a year, whether it's whether it's you know, March 15th, and that's when you finalized your strategy. Every March 15th, come back to it and say, okay, what do we know now? Or, you know, the end of the year is a fantastic time to assess it, right? Budgets are being set Mm -hmm. uh, right before you have to make your budget proposals. Right. Is a fantastic time to review it and and make the tweaks and, and again, be able to go to you know, the board or the C-suite and say, here's my plan for video content and here's the budget that I need to do that. Whether it's taking in year two, we were gonna do more mid-level content and actually fleshing that out, knowing what that is and what kind of resources you need to execute Mm -hmm. that. Um, I mean, you know. Let's say it's, right now it's February when we're recording this. Should I wait until November to do this so that right before budget season, I've got a plan? For me, I think the philosophy is like buying a house. Best time to buy a house is now. If you sit around waiting for the perfect time, Mm -hmm. something's going to be off anyway. You're going to miss the right house. Rates aren't going to be perfect, whatever. Buying a house is a long-term investment. So the earlier you can get started in it, the better off you are, right? Because, yeah, if you you create your strategy now and start executing some of that until, you know, Q4 – and then you take a look at what you've learned and reassess. Yeah, I'm going to spend fifty thousand dollars on video, and I'm and <clears throat> I'm going to learn a lot between now and October, and I'm going to figure out what I learned so that by the end of November I can say this is my plan for next year and ask for that in my budget mm-hmm. meetings. So I feel like so many people are looking at short term. How can I make Q3 or how how can I make Q1 even look good? I, I don't have an answer for you. I can't. I can't come in. From a video perspective, I can't come in and define. Uh, oh, if it's February twelfth and yeah. you're asking me to help affect Q1 numbers, yeah, and you don't have some weird fiscal calendar where Q1 is like July, <laughs> right? Um, we a, probably should have started working on this Q2 last year, right? Or, or whatever. I mean, yeah. that you know, in a nicer way. That's why I don't do the outreach. <laughs> <laughs> but you you can't. I mean, you can, you can't be all that short term focused. You have to have a longer outlook on this even though things are changing like we said in the beginning you've got to have that plan for the long term so that in short term you can prioritize things correctly and make the right decisions as you move forward yeah it, it, you're you're a much better position at the end of q1 if you didn't hit your numbers you're in a much better position if you know where you're going than if you can say well i fucked up true and to that point part of defining a strategy is defining what success is Right. So when, when you go to, to execute phase seven, which is the analysis, you determined, you know, what's a win, right? And so, so it's easier just to know. I mean, the, again, this kind of goes back to point one. Putting the strategy together, part of that is defining su- success metrics so that when you look at the numbers, you know what you're measuring them against. And so... I guess my point is without going through the strategic planning in the first place, you're never going to define success. And so once you have launched something, it's harder to tell whether it's working or not. Yeah. And the whole point is to say, this is the bar I'm going to set based on the information I have. Yeah. Then we're going to execute this and then we're going to look at, did we hit the bar that we set? Mm -hmm. And you can say, we didn't hit the bar that we set. And if you didn't, you can say, we didn't hit the bar that we set because we made the wrong type of content. Or you can say, it turns out our assumptions were wrong, and so we need to change our assumptions. Now we know that this is the right bar I'd feel to way more comfortable walking into a board meeting having failed, but knowing where I'm going. Yeah. That, or, or here's how I failed, and here's what I learned, and here's what I'm going to do next. Then I don't know what then, it did. Then, oh, we just didn't hit it. That looks pretty fucking stupid. Yeah. I mean, I can see going into a manager's meeting like that, but not a board meeting yeah. like that. 
And all of a sudden, they're like, why does this person work for us? Yeah, right? Um, okay. No, I think, that, I think those are some good closing points. Um, <clears throat> let's hear very briefly from our sponsor once again. Right. We got Pillsbury Pregnancy Program for Men. If you're like most men these days, you're probably asking yourself, how can I be a better feminist? I marched in DC back in 2017. I've committed to the he for she global movement. I even shave my legs every day and wear high heels at home. What more should I be doing? It's time to get pregnant. The Pillsbury Pregnancy Program for Men. I guess just Google it, I don't know. Yeah. All right, well, Stella has indicated that she's ready to move on to to something else. So that is our podcast episode for today. Thank you so much for listening, especially to the minute mark that we're at right here. You know, rate, subscribe, all those kinds of things. Really, now it's more about like, what do you want us to talk about? Right? Let's have a conversation here as a podcast community. What do you want us to talk about? My guess is we'll talk about that. Because yeah. we've got a whole... I want to solve. I want to help solve people's problems. I don't. We got a whole long list of topics we can talk about. But again, if it's not the kind of stuff that y'all don't that y'all want to hear, why should we even spend this time prepping and and recording these? So, let us know what you want us to talk about. We will answer you, and uh, you know, let's all learn. All right. How about this? First person to give us a legitimate topic, we'll give a fifty dollar gift card to, to Amazon. To Amazon. To visit the Amazon? $50 toward <laughs> yeah, we'll, visiting the Amazon? We'll take you $50 there. Uh, no, but I want some feedback. I'm also going to... $50 is under a $100 threshold. So that's right. You so can, I can, you can give it to I anybody. Can, yeah. You can do 99 You can do not, 90 I'm gonna, it's, I'm gonna But do it's going to be 50 Excuse, It's 50 <laughs> Tell us what you want. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. Thanks love for subscribing. You. Thanks for... So much. We, we do I'm love you. the bottom of my storyboard heart. Cold, dark storyboard heart. Hey, Stella. That kiss is probably just the best way to end it. Hmm? That kiss is probably just the best way to end it. Oh, I didn't even—I didn't hear your kiss. I gave it a little. Oh, what are you Stella kissing you? The Stella kissing my tongue. Mm. All right. You must smell the hormones. Well, you, not, you may not know. I'm not pregnant. How dare you? <laughs> I'm just big bone. <clears throat> I feel like uh, I don't bring Stalin in too often, but it's usually on podcast day. <laughs> not really thinking ahead. She was really... Uh, really uh, oh, God, I went over there. She just very passive-aggressive. It was like...